Right, good evening everybody. Um, my name's Mark Hilton from uh, Unomia. I'm here tonight uh, representing Zero Waste Scotland. We've been helping to organise this lecture programme uh, for the circular economy uh, side of, of Zero Waste Scotland. And tonight uh, we're lecture three. You're welcome to uh, Strathclyde University and the Technology and Innovation Centre. Um, this is the, the programme for the evening. So um, we've got David Milliken here from Scottish Enterprise who looks after the high value uh, manufacturing side of things at Scottish Enterprise. David's just going to introduce the topic of um, circular economy. And um, we've then got at quarter past six Connie Backer, who's our, our guest speaker, who's come especially all the way from TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, Connie's a, an expert in circular economy um, and the associated business models. And, uh, and then after that, at seven o'clock or thereabouts, we've got a Q&A session. Um, myself, David, and, and Connie will be answering any questions you've got um, from the presentation or you know, that occur to you otherwise. And then finally, uh, we've got some networking and drinks and nibbles outside, back where you had coffee uh, in the cafe there. So uh, in terms of housekeeping, I should just mention a few things. There's no planned fire alarm tonight. Um, so if you do hear a fire alarm, you should exit through. There's two doors here and the door you came in through there. The assembly point is out onto George Street at the, at the front there and, and turn right. There'll be people from the uh, university will help guide us to that if, if needs be, but there's uh, no great chance of that, I hope. Um, the toilets, if you haven't already found them, there's some out in the foyer out there at the, uh, at the front and also around by the cafe if you need those. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to, to David, who's going to talk to you about the circular economy. Yes, Thanks, David. Right. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, as I say, welcome, especially for coming out in such a, a cold night. Um, I'm here to give you some introduction to the topic, to talk about circular economy, in particular why that's of interest to us um, from a manufacturing perspective. As, um, as we said before, I'm from Scottish Enterprise, the high value manufacturing team, we are looking at all aspects of high value manufacturing from aerospace, defence, marine through to chemicals and life sciences. Um, so really it's an interesting topic from our point of view and we want to see how this can fit add into Scotland's manufacturing agenda. So hopefully this works. Yeah, I've been asked to just reiterate if it wasn't said already. Um, during the uh, event itself, if you want to basically contact us using Twitter, uh, again, the fact is that uh, make things last. Uh, say the fact is that uh, I don't know if it's just this particular slide that has the chart in the kilt or if it's uh, <laughs> part of a theme, but it's uh, certainly be remembered anyway. Um, just. So, circular economy, and really one of the things about it is I'm not um, an expert in all aspects of the circular economy, but one of the things which we will talk about is why it's been really important from the point of view of a manufacturing agenda. Uh, and it's not just about a different approach to design and uh, some of the aspects that grab the attention quite often. Uh, one of the things that will be crucial in terms of developing a robust approach to circular economy is to involve those that make stuff, manufacturers, and especially when you lead towards new manufacturing systems, and as I said before, new business models. We're starting to hear anecdotally that you know companies are getting challenged by clients and by customers to say, we want you to adopt a different approach. We don't want to buy products from you anymore. We want to use them because we don't need the product. We just need the service that it provides. So we've done that in some other areas. Rolls-Royce have had power by the hour, which is basically leasing of engines for many years. And that was almost like one of those areas where you said, that's OK, that's in that particular sector. But that process and that behavior is starting to stretch into other areas as well. So large clients are now challenging, especially to SMEs at times to say, well, we used to buy this product for you, but now we want to lease it because we are not in the business of owning vehicles or whatever it is that they may use the service for. So that in itself brings a whole different challenge 
to businesses and to organisations. And quite often, it's not necessarily the technical challenge of producing the product. It's going to be that new business model and how they actually arrange that. So, for example, that could be anything from servitisation, where's my revenue stream coming from, what's going to happen after the product comes back to me, and where's my secondary use. So, the circular economy, from that point of view, has to have at its heart the manufacturing uh, systems approach. And that means the fact is it's really important to us in developing our manufacturing uh, strategy. So the fact is that in the manufacturing context, we really need to say that this is one of the areas where we provide resilience. The old ways of doing things, as I've said before, are now being challenged by clients and customers. So if that's going to be the case, you then have to say, what are you going to do? Um, a small SME said that to me one time said, I can't turn around to the NHS and say, well, that's not really how we do it, because that's not an option if I want to keep that business. So the whole thing about it, he then needs to adapt the way that his business model works. Interestingly, from his point of view, he didn't feel uh, threatened <coughs> or overwhelmed by the technical capability that was required to still produce the product. What he felt was lacking was where was he going to get the new procurement model or the new um, terms of bringing back products and reuse, different approach to sales, how much did they charge? The whole business model aspect was an area which was new to him. And it felt quite, as he said, keeping him awake at night. So I think the whole thing about it is it's about that resilience and access to new markets, and in some cases protecting access to existing markets, which is really, really crucial, and why leaders in the businesses have to be open and aware of the development of circular economy principles. I think the whole aspect of them in some cases to say, well, this is just what we'll do and we'll carry on the way before. Um, part of the problem in certain respects is, especially for small uh, and SMEs, they're so in the, the here and now dealing with today's issues, making sure shipments go out the door, that to, curl, to turn around and basically say to them, you need to be looking at what's the disruptive elements in your sector is sometimes very challenging. So I think the whole thing about it is they know and they hear um, papers and they hear documentaries and they see stuff on the television about circular economy, what it could save them or indeed what they will lose by not being able to access those markets. But being able to actually free up the time to look at that is another challenge. So one of the things which uh, brings me to these events is because when we were putting together the Manufacturing Action Plan, or a manufacturing future for Scotland, to give it its proper title. Um, we basically were looking at what we needed to do to reinvigorate and to provide sustainable growth in Scotland's manufacturing sector. Um, started back in about 2015, and as I said to somebody one time, when we looked at what we needed to address, the usual thing, a bit like the football cliche, the first four names in the team sheet were investment, innovation, leadership, and skills. And that, that was where we would all start. Um, but then we got to thinking and saying, well, what else do we need to consider? What is the future going to look like for manufacturing? Let's OK address the here and now. And that was the first four elements of it. But we also looked at what would provide some future proofing and some other areas which might be uh, more challenging. One of them was circular economy. And the reason why it's been really useful is to try and, as we said before, look at what's coming at the, the world of the manufacturer and what does he have to do to either protect the market or to exploit new opportunities. So it was a really important part to include circular economy within the, uh, the manufacturing action plan. And I think one of the things about that is that at the time we had two key um, policy documents and strategies from the government and they really linked in really quite well, which was, as I said, the manufacturing action plan and the Make Things Last strategy from Zero Waste Scotland. So we re recognised that the two could work in concert with each other and we should basically look at where we can bring that world of manufacturing into the Make Things Last uh, strategy as well. So one of the things about it, and it's part of the reason for this lecture th series, is to actually raise that awareness and to make sure the fact is that those in manufacturing recognise that what happened in the past isn't necessarily how we will do business in the future. 
So one of the things we said earlier is that when we looked at certain areas, for example, skills, um, and a wee bit kind of controversial, one, one time somebody said, if you're designing for the circular economy, design, and I'm sure there's some students in here that will design, you design to a brief, and if someone gives you a different brief, you'll design to that brief. The difference is that whereas people have maybe been if almost like honed in on their business model and it's very tight margins, etc., and they know how it works today, breaking out of that mold can be very difficult. So the skills has got to be not just around the technical skills as well, but as I said earlier, around the business skills that go with developing a circular economy. So areas like logistics and take back, how does that work? There's a whole area of work there which um, is already underway, but I'm sure there'll be other challenges coming along. As we said before, the world of procurement also, as I said, potentially disruptive because in the past you knew what your orders were, it was very linear, you'd buy X, you'd divide it by Y number of products, there was your price. What do you do now when you're getting the product back in 18 months time and how do you refurbish it? So a lot of challenges around the skills required to support a circular economy model and as I say, it's really one of those areas where from the point of view of the Manufacturing Action Plan, and there's work going on with Skills Development Scotland to identify what those skills are and how we address that in the future. So the thing I was going to say, just actually one last thing, is about the importance of the circular economy as part of the Manufacturing Action Plan, is where we see the fact is that there'll be more um, disruptive elements in the future, but also more opportunities as well. So companies that need to take this on board and wake up to the fact that it's actually really timely that they do so now. As I said before, the, really, the problem is, in certain respects, the leaders, especially in small companies, are so down in today's operations that how do they get, make themselves that time to do this? So I'm not saying it's easy, I'm saying the fact is there's a, there's a challenge there. Which brings us to the fact, the reason for us being here tonight, the series of lectures, um, Again, the whole thing about it is that uh, we really need to raise that awareness. Uh, quite often, in some sectors, there is good awareness, but they don't necessarily know what else they could be doing. Um, I was saying just before the start, in our particular area of, uh, of aerospace that we look after, um, in the aerospace sector, they've been doing circular economy for, since night, for the last 50 years, but they call it MRO, Maintenance, Repair and Overhaul. So in some areas, there is already good circular practice. But what we're saying is we don't really care if you don't append that badge to it. The fact is you need to be looking at and saying, what is it I do within my business that makes better use of resources and provides improved profitability? So the whole thing about it is that the lecture series is something that's used to bring up the awareness. It's aimed <coughs> to, uh, specifically at manufacturers. Um, Zero Waste Scotland have been very supportive in terms of using financial resources to support the move towards circular economy models and you know, case studies, etc., are available on their website. I think the whole thing about it is that the aspect of how business was done in the past isn't necessarily what's going to happen in the future. And there are resources and support available. So from the point of view of, of companies, um, they don't need to have all the answers. In places like the Scottish Enterprise and the Zero Waste Scotland, if someone says, I need to find out about this, where do I go for advice and support? That's fine, that's exactly what we do. What we're combating against is, yeah, I know this is important and I'll have a look at it tomorrow. Right? That's where the whole aspect about looking at it now and having an, an awareness and a strategy for the dealing with this is really important. So the series of lectures are Again, as you can see, there's, this is the third, so we're in the middle of the, the program. Um, the fact is that there's four and five to go. One of the things which would uh, be really good, and it's not just a, a plea from, my, from myself, but from others as well, is about spreading the word. And if there's people you know who should be interested in this kind of stuff, go to Zero Waste Scotland's website, find out with the lecture series, and pass the word on. Certainly, that's what we've all been trying to do to get the message out there. Um, people don't need to necessarily have the answer, need to have the answers, but they need to be aware and need to be taken cognizance of what's coming at them. So the master classes um, is a follow on. I mean, the lecture series is just to whet the appetite. The, the master class series, again, um, 
targeted and aimed at, at, at its, uh, SMEs. The whole thing about that is that we, we'll be looking towards um, more information about that in the autumn. And as I say, the fact is that uh, if you think there's something that might be of interest, <coughs> then get involved, have a look at the Zero Waste Scotland website, um, and actually take the, the fact is that we can do more to spread the word. So uh, one of the things about this is that really, from our point of view, we see circular economy as being fundamental to Scotland's manufacturing agenda. Um, the whole thing about that is there's opportunities and there's also threats for manufacturing companies. Um, a lot of them are quite traditional in their outlook. Um, and the whole thing about that is that this is what we're trying to break through. And again, we're saying well, you don't have to have the answer, but by the same token, what's a disruptive threat that could come into your sector from someone who takes a different approach. Right. As, le as leaders in businesses, that's the job. They're supposed to be looking and thinking, what is it I'm doing X years in the future to make sure the fact is that I'm still in business? Um, so from our point of view within the Manufacturing Action Plan, this is absolutely critical. Um, others are, the other themes I mentioned are also critical, but with the one token, circular economy is something which is sometimes very difficult to explain to manufacturing companies who have done something the same way for many, many years. So they can look at other sectors, they can take, for example, as I said, in aerospace, where they do this, is there something they can learn from other sectors themselves? Um, so it's not a case of it's all bad news, but the same token, they have to have an awareness and be ready for this. So uh, again, the fact is that the Masterclass series will be more information in the autumn. And um, say, if you're interested, then have a look at the, the website. Um, just before I move on uh, to our next speaker, just a, a basic uh, introduction then to, to Dr. Connie Backer. Um, I'm now going to embarrass her and say she's no longer an associate professor. She actually is now a full professor. So uh, uh, I, I promise Connie I wouldn't ask you all to stand up and applaud, but with the same token, the, She's dying in the corner there. Um, from the uh, TU in Delft, the, the University of Technology in Delft. And uh, I say, Connie's from the Industrial Design uh, Faculty and looks at sustainable design and circular product design. So a real expert in this field. I think when putting together the, the, um, the lecture series, and you'll see from the, the, the website and the profile, um, someone actually quoted that the lecture series was, and I quote, wanting to bring the rock stars of circular economy to Scotland. Yeah, and um, so therefore we have got some really, really influential speakers as part of these um, master class, sorry, these lecture series. So Delft University is consistently ranked among the leading European University of Technology. So it's very appropriate that we're in another university which is a very technolo technological focus. Um, and I say the fact is that, so Connie has an interest in circular resource efficient and resilient economy models. And so the fact is that uh, she's going to talk to you today about repair, remanufacturing, and closed re re recycling. So from that point of view, what better could there be from a manufacturing perspective than to talk about that, given that I mentioned MRO in the aerospace sector, other areas as well of automotive, for example, who are doing stuff with refurbishment. So I think it's really, really um, salient that uh, Connie's our speaker tonight. Okay. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Connie. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was an amazing introduction. Let me see if I can make this work. Yes, excellent. So, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Uh, next week, my teaching semester starts again and I'll be responsible for teaching 400 design students about design for sustainability and the circular economy. So this actually feels like a holiday to me, a short holiday before the real work begins. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of my uh, insights that I learned over the years from working with companies and studying literature on companies about their transitioning towards more circular models. But first, uh, uh, in introduction, uh, this is the campus where I'm based. Uh, the faculty where I work is not in this picture. This picture was taken more or less from the faculty. Uh, uh, this is, of course, uh, 
a summer view. The campus currently looks a little bit more bleak. Um, but we have a faculty which is one of the largest industrial design faculties in the world. So uh, it, is, um, it is quite something to work there and to be able to influence so many young minds. Uh, my field of research is designed for a circular economy. And when we think about uh, design for a circular economy, this is very often the first thing that comes to mind. And this is, of course, ocean plastic. And I'm sure you are all aware of the problems of ocean plastic. Yeah, um, so we won't go into that. Uh, and there's companies like Adidas and many others who create beautiful products from these terribly polluting um, materials. And um, this is a shoe called, a sneaker called Parley. And you may have seen it. And there's actually many other initiatives of companies developing uh, textiles and other garments from ocean plastics, uh, which is a beautiful thing in its own. But, and what Adidas is trying to do here is actually um, try to find solutions from the waste that we are creating in our linear economic system, our, as you know, our take, make, use, waste system. So, um, which in itself is an excellent initiative, but being an academic, I can't help also being somewhat critical, because uh, with Adidas uh, taking waste and using it as a resource, which is great, but if this still is a, as a sneaker which will go into this linear system, there is really no reason why such a beautiful sneaker won't end up as ocean plastic again at the end of its life. So, what we need is, of course, a circular system. And this is a very simplistic diagram, and I'm well aware of that. But um, what I'm trying to say here is that what we need is really to close these material loops, and not just close them, but also slow down this flow of resources through the economy uh, by making products last longer, making things last, and also by intensifying their use so that we can uh, use them better before they need to go back into the system. Now, this is all probably thinking that is quite familiar to you. Uh, it's, of course, the whole circular economy thinking. And I'm guessing you've seen this, right? Uh, yeah, I see some nods. Anybody who's not seen this? I won't go into a lot of detail. So, of course, this is the butterfly diagram of the circular economy. And the only thing I want to say about this is that it really clearly shows the necessity to both close those resource loops, so the outer loops, the blue and the green ones, um, which is about bringing back, recovering materials and bringing them back into this economic system. And it's about these inner loops, which are about making products last longer and intensifying their use through repair and redistribution and reuse and remanufacturing, etc. And on the other hand, on the green end, about cascading, which is the biological equivalent. So this model is, is really uh, something that has, has influenced uh, my thinking and those of many others. And uh, it probably was initiated uh, quite a couple of years ago by uh, a professor in Switzerland, Walter Stahel. He's, I think, one of the founding fathers of this kind of thinking. And uh, we translated his, uh, some of his work in, in some graphics. And, one of the things I really like and I teach my students about is the inertia principle, which he postulated. And this says, do not repair what is not broken, do not remanufacture um, a thing that cannot be repaired, that can be repaired, and do not recycle a product that can be remanufactured. In other words, replace or treat only the smallest possible part in order to maintain the existing economic value. I still can't do it by heart, I realize. I thought I could. And this inertia principle is like um, a kind of priority order. So if we are going to talk about how to profit from these different uh, circular economy loops, um, uh, following the inertia principle is one way forward. So this is also the way I'm going to try to talk about how to profit from repair, remanufacture and closed loop recycling which is the topic of this lecture. Um, the way I intend to do this is by exploring with you, over the next 40 minutes or so, past, present and future. Circular economy may seem really new, 
but actually it isn't. Um, it, is, um, it is a concept that has grown over the years and developed from other concepts. And um, so I'm, we're first going to look at a case study from history, and then I'm going to take a couple of case studies from sort of now, and I'm going to take a look at what's coming in the future. And I'm going to start with um, a case from 20 years ago, Herman Miller, and I guess this is a company that you probably have heard of. They are famous for their office furniture, an American company. Um, in 2001, the Harvard Business School developed a case study on Cradle to Cradle and Herman Miller, and it describes in, in great detail, it's a great case study to read, by the way, if you can get your hands on it, it describes in great detail how the company Herman Miller trans used Cradle to Cradle, in, started to introduce the whole idea of Cradle to Cradle within their business, and how they implemented this whole concept, this protocol, um, in the operations of their business. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this case study and the lessons drawn from it. But first, uh, a quick intro into Cradle to Cradle for those of you who may not be so familiar with that. Um, it's actually one of, the, clearly one of the forerunner vision, visions of the circular economy. You can see how indebted the whole circular economy diagram is um, to Cradle to Cradle. Uh, this, this vision, if you like, or design approach was developed by a German chemist, Michael Braungart, and an American architect, William McDonough. And they argued uh, that we should look at products uh, either as biological materials and nutrients or as technological materials and nutrients, and they should be able to cycle either in the biosphere, uh, where they could be broken down and reused again, or in the technosphere, where they could be recycled indefinitely. And so it's clear, obviously, uh, where the circular economy got this thinking. Um, and in those days, Cradle to Cradle was hot, and back in 2000, approximately. And Herman Miller was one of those companies that tried to incorporate it in their business and tried to make their company Cradle to Cradle certified. This is their product, and you may have seen this picture. It's, it's quite often published. So the end of this process is that they used uh, this chair as a case, and they developed, redesigned and developed this chair to be ultimately easy to disassemble within minutes, and that each of these different parts uh, is highly recyclable. That's the, where they sort of, um, what, they, what they set out to achieve, uh, and which they also achieved at the end of, the, of this trajectory. And they are still doing this nowadays. But the case study, in fact, by Harvard Business School, focuses on the armrest of this chair, of the, the, the office chair in case. And, um, and that's interesting, actually, uh, because of being able to focus on one particular part of this chair, it's easy to bring out all the problems the company faced during this transition. And in this armrest, in those days, uh, each and every office uh, furniture developer used PVC, polyvinyl chloride. It was the plastic to use. It was uh, inexpensive, highly durable, e easy to produce, and everybody just used it. But the Cradle to Cradle protocol was very clear about PVC. It's a toxic material, it's toxic during production, it's toxic during recycling and disposal, and it was not to be used. And the alternative material that was suggested was TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane. So Herman Miller very quickly found themselves with a huge dilemma because they used PVC and they had to move to TPU, which was more expensive, um, which had huge uncertainties. They didn't know whether they could produce it with the same molds in time. They had a huge deadline coming up with a big furniture fair where they wanted to produce to, to show, showcase their latest chair, which was important, and they were totally uncertain about the performance of this material. Would it be as durable as PVC? Would it be scratch resistant? So any one of you who is in a business or who has worked with a business, at some point you may recognize these kind of dilemmas. Um, if a, a company wants to do what's best for the environment, and then the real world intervenes, and, and it becomes clear that 
uh, the changes that you wanted to make are too risky or too costly, and then what? So how do you push through this? How do you convince and how do you actually uh, find the right arguments to, to create uh, a change? So within Herman Miller, this led to a huge crisis and, uh, and huge discussions, of course, between all the different design teams, R&D teams, man marketing management, CEOs. And in the end, um, they decided to go for TPU. So they made the difficult decision to take the risk and take the costs. And that was because they took a long view and they decided they would uh, entail this risk because they wanted to capture the first mover advantage of being an environmental leader in the field. And um, in those days, PVC was sort of demo demonized and more and more customers of Herman Miller started to ask for PVC-free products. So they thought, well, if we take a long view, PVC might uh, very well be, uh, you know, uh, abolished uh, and we might actually even um, be leaders in terms that we proactively uh, uh, change the whole, f whole office furniture field, legislation will probably follow and then we will be safe and sound. So uh, taking this long view made them uh, realize that they could take this risk and make this decision. And. Um, it, it was indeed a difficult one. Uh, uh, they did incur quite a lot of cost. It wasn't so easy to produce as they had hoped, but it was quite durable, thankfully. And in the end, one of the lessons learned is that um, um, dealing with such dilemmas where you have to face uh, uh, environmental, what's good for the environment versus costs, can be solved if companies do manage to take a long view. And that's something uh, to think about when we are moving towards circular. But there's also a clear weakness in this whole story, which is that Cradle to Cradle to Protocol in those days did provide no mechanism at all for really closing the loop. Because Herman Miller now produces products that are, you know, easy to recycle, easy to disassemble, uh, safe and clean, but there's no infrastructure in place and no real business models in place to get them, to actually recover them and to capture the value from these products. And the Creative Credit Protocol doesn't provide much support for that. And that's where the, the circular economy actually differs. So this is what I now would like to explore, the present, and how companies go about really closing this loop. And I have three cases I would like to discuss. First is Bugaboo. That's a, a stroller, a Dutch company design, that designs and develops baby strollers. And they did a lease and refurbish pilot. I want to talk about Leap. Uh, it's a, an Apple refurbishment company based in the Netherlands. And I want to talk about a French company, Neopost, that does remanufacturing. Now, Bugaboo uh, is, uh, is an interesting company. It's really design-driven. It's based in Amsterdam. They started small, but they have very quickly grown into an international company with um, about 1,400 employees. And they produce and, uh, and sell their products now uh, in around 50 countries around the world. And um, I was involved uh, with Bugaboo in a uh, European uh, Horizon 2020 project called Rescom, and I had uh, the privilege of following Bugaboo over four years while they were developing a pilot uh, for the company to start doing lease and refurbishment of their strollers. Um, one of the reasons that Bugaboo wanted to engage in such a pilot was because of this. Uh, the strollers they develop are high-end they're actually very expensive to buy. Um, being a mom, I can testify to that. Um, and they actually uh, have a huge second-hand value because you can imagine these, these strollers are not used for that long. Babies grow quickly and, um, and then they are sold on the second-hand market. And there's quite a few very clever entrepreneurial people who then start buying up second-hand strollers, refurbishing them although refurbishment is probably not the right word here, it's more patching up um, and repairing them with, with something uh, and then selling them. And uh, again, 
and and these are sort of this is an informal market and this is an example of a basement that somebody uses uh, who buys and sells these uh, uncertified refurbished strollers now for bugaboo of course this is slightly worrying because these patched up strollers uh, may affect uh, their brand value if you buy one of those and it's not functioning really well no warranty um, uh, you just have to deal with it, but it can reflect badly on the brand. And, uh, and actually they thought, why can't we capture this value from the market? So if we manage to lease uh, strollers and then get them back, refurbish them, lease them again, we can capture this value, we can actually sell them twice. So that was their motivation. And um, they did develop uh, a, um, a pilot, a leasing package for strollers. They piloted it over a period of two and a half years with 50 customers. And they also included uh, a Bugaboo refurbished uh, model in there, just to see how it would fly. And one of the interesting things they did, they developed a very specific value proposition for their stroller. And uh, because if you just say, well, you can lease a stroller and uh, we want it back after a year or two, they thought, well, that may not be so attractive. We want to have a very attractive value proposition for our customers, so they thought, uh, we will give them the opportunity to change the stroller uh, according to changing needs. So in the lease period, you were allowed once or twice to come back to Bugaboo and say, well, my baby has grown, I, do, I want a different stroller that, will be, that has grown with my baby because it's bigger now, it's a toddler, so I want a different stroller. Or I may have a second child and I want a, a duo stroller where, which can have both kids. So the value proposition was that you had flexibility to change stroller in this period. Great. I think it's a great idea. And the way it worked, you had to pay a deposit of 200 euros and a fixed monthly fee. Now, this may all seem pretty straightforward, um, but it was fascinating to watch uh, uh, how quickly this became extremely complex. And just, I can tell you this, but a picture speaks louder than words, I think. Um, Imagine, Bragbu used to be a company that would just, you know, sell a stroller and then, and then would never, you know, basically uh, have anything to do with it anymore. And, uh, and this, is, this was their new model, the way they had envisioned it. So it's easy to see how much more complex this is. It just imagine a straight line and now you see all these loops and, and things going back. So uh, the, the strollers get produced uh, at the beginning and then they go out for the first lease and then they're supposed to come back, they're being refurbished, they go out for a second lease, they come back and get refurbished, then, they, then the second, second, the third time around, they will sell the refurbished strollers, that was the idea, to the market, service them, uh, and, when, and of course then they also in, took into account that probably these refurbished strollers would end up on the second hand market anyway, and they would try to find ways to keep servicing those second hand market strollers. As well, so you see all these return flows and all these attempts at getting stuff um, back to recyclers and, re and being able to refurbish. So you can see the complexity in thinking. So clearly, there were many lessons learned here. Um, Bugaboo quickly realized it was not optimized for acting as a service provider. Um, the administrative uh, um, burden was really amazing. They had to develop contracts with their customers that they had never done before to think about what to put in a contract like that and how to make you know, this, this work legally. They had to do credit checks, which actually cost money and which, which was eating into their, their profit margin. And they had to then, customers that wouldn't pay their monthly fee, they had to chase them. So it was all new to them. Um, they had no experience whatsoever with reverse logistics, so they had to figure out which partners they could use to work with that and, uh, and actually get these strollers back. And when they were back, they had no system in place to determine the quality of the returned stroller. Uh, so they had trouble tracking and tracing uh, the parts that, that came back and, and trouble actually refurbishing because the stroller wasn't designed to be refurbished. Um, and they also found uh, that once th they said they would certify refurbished strollers, but then they found there was no standard in place to help them certified, certify a refurbished stroller. They're just not there. 
Um, the stroller world is heavily uh, certified, by the way. There's lots and lots of standards they need to adhere to, but there's nothing on refurbished strollers. Again, a new area for them. And, and the last thing, and this was a bit of a disappointment for us all, is that when the strollers came back, they were really beaten up, uh, dirty. Uh, there even was one stroller that had a sandwich, which hadn't been eaten, folded in. <laughs> which it's, it, so the customers didn't take care of the products as we had expected they would. And even though they had to pay a 200 euro deposit fee, they still treated them different. So that was a fascinating case. And among the lessons learned, um, this was a pilot and it ran for two and a half years. And all the things, all the challenges I explained uh, were a part of the pilot. And so it was extremely, extremely useful for the company to understand the kind of capacities they needed to develop these circular models and how extremely complicated it was. It is like setting up a totally new business, this whole idea of going circular. Um, and that's something they had really underestimated. And us too, to be honest. We thought, how difficult can it be? Um, and, but the good thing is it had a really positive effect on the product design. Uh, they learned a lot by getting these strollers back. They learned how they could make uh, more efficient strollers, how they could start thinking in terms of modularity, intergenerational modularity, about repairability. So it also had some positives. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not sure they will actually take on the challenge and continue developing uh, towards circularity. Sometimes when pilots... Um, Pilots are good, but sometimes they, they teach us lessons that are so, that it's so difficult that it, that company may actually shy away from taking the next step. So that's something I haven't, I haven't found an answer to, how to prevent this from happening. What it taught us also is, um, and Bugbill was one of the companies that helped us develop these six design strategies for longer lasting products. Um, it taught us as designers uh, how we can think about designing products that fit within a circular economy. So I'll just quickly run through them. I won't spend a lot of time, but the, 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 the top strategy is designing for attachment and trust. So if you can somehow enable through your design a customer or a client or a consumer to be to attach him or herself to your products, the likelihood that he or she will keep it for longer increases. Uh, of course, there's design for durability, design for standardization and compatibility, which is really important if you start thinking about going modular. Um, there's design for ease of maintenance and repair, design for upgradability and adaptability, if you want to create future-proof designs. And finally, there's design for this and reassembly. And we've listed them from one to six because uh, they actually are in a kind of order of from high to low product integrity. So the higher you go, the more intact the product remains. Um, the lower you go, the, the more the product sort of, um, well, the less intact it is. Um, so that was something that we took from this pilot as, as being product designers and we teach this to our students. The next case I want to discuss is Leap. Who has heard of Leap before? I'm just curious. <laughs> Nobody? Oh, cool. Um, so D Leap is a Dutch company, and it's, uh, it, it, it refurbishes Apple products and only Apple products. And, and as you can see, the name Leap is an anagram for Apple, so it's the same letters. And, um, and they are really, really clever in their approach because they also they buy up uh, Apple stores that close. Uh, so this is actually an old Apple store that is now being used by Leap to sell refurbished Apple products. And, um, and we call companies like Leap gap exploiters uh, because they um, they are very clever in, in 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 exploiting leftover value in products. So Apple products, as you all know, they are, they are expensive, they are high value, and, uh, and when people, and, and you can sell them on second-hand market and they're still uh, worth quite a bit. 
So Leap has actually captured the value that's still in all these, that still remains in these Apple products and sells them through refurbishment. But they are not a re an Apple re certified refurbisher. The market for refurbished devices uh, is actually growing, and in Holland it's growing exponentially. And this is a, a slide from, um, or a picture from a Deloitte report that says, we predict that used smartphones will represent about 7% of the total smartphone sales by units in 2016. That's up 5% from 2015, and I, I guess that at least in the Netherlands this has gone up even more now. Um, Leap has been very clever in marketing their refurbished iPhones and I, I can see and read in the newspapers that their sales are really going through the roof and they've grown from four people to a couple of hundred at the moment. And not just Leap is now j jumping into the refurbished device market, but many others are doing the same. Many others are doing the same. So we have like huge numbers of uh, refurbished device Offers, offers in the Netherlands, and, um, and they are popular. Uh, but we also already are starting to see the first problems coming, um, because consumers are more and more in trouble understanding quality indicators, such as Apple certified pre-owned, renewed, reborn, and at some point they just get lost, and they don't know what exactly they are buying, which is again uh, possibly a problem. But one of the lessons that we took from the Leap case is the question, and I don't have an answer, and it's something we may discuss uh, uh, after this lecture. So to what extent should OEMs try to capture the residual value of devices themselves? Why isn't Apple doing this? Why do they leave, leave these well, products, all the value in them? Why do they leave it to a company like Leap to capture this value? It's a, it's a mystery to me, honestly. I know that Apple sells refurbished products, it's, 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 very, it's a very small part of their business and it's, very, it's sort of hidden away on their website somewhere. But why aren't they taking the lead here? It's, 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 maybe you have an answer, I'm really curious to hear your opinion. Maybe afterwards. My next case is uh, Neopost Remanufacturing, French company, they develop franking machines. So these are machines that put uh, f f that frank put post post uh, post segels well, but uh, and they do about 300 letters per minute, and um, they are a business to business company. The other two companies, Leap and Bugaboo, are business to consumer, and they have been refurbishing for a couple of years now. Um, they can do this because they lease their postal uh, franking machines to their business to business customers, so they are quite certain that they get their products back and they can refurbish them and remanufacture them. Interestingly enough, this particular project product here um, <coughs> has a preset lifespan. So Neopost has decided this franking machine will last 10 years and it will have one use cycle of five years and a second use cycle of another five years. That may not sound very radical or um, revolutionary, but for designers, this is like a godsend. Because if you have to design uh, uh, such a product for remanufacturing, knowing when the product comes back and when it therefore needs to be remanufactured uh, and when it then comes back again, is really extremely helpful. So it has allowed the Neopost design department to redesign the bearings, these were in this blue plastic case and they could be very, they were very difficult uh, to access, to redesign them to en enable easier access to the bearings and at the same time reduce the disassembly depth of these machines, but also they were able to rethink the electronics inside and develop uh, a motherboard that had a higher memory capacity from the outset so that when the machine came back, they knew they would not have to touch the electronics. They would still be good to go for the next cycle. So for product designers, being able um, uh, actually to, to, to plan in time the life cycle of a product uh, and to see uh, when they can expect the product back is really powerful. And it's something you don't see very often with reman companies. What I most of the time see is that um, the remanufacturing division is 
situated here and the new product development division is situated somewhere else, sometimes also geographically very far apart and these two divisions just don't talk to each other. And, and so what you then see is that the new product development needs to it needs to, you know, of course, create a product that's, that's cheap and they need to develop uh, cheap enough at least and they need to, to get within the budget, stay within the budget, so they don't do these things which are actually costly. And, um, and then, of course, once the product comes back to the Riemann and Asset Recovery Department, they are in trouble because then they need to start replacing parts that could have been pre-designed to last. So a great case study, Neopost. And one of the other lessons learned from this case study is that the design issues here, once they have the life cycle planning in stage, were easy to resolve. But managing the Riemann manufacturing process is a much greater challenge. This has everything to do with the quality of the products you get back. Finally, I want to talk a bit about the future of Circular. And I've just discussed three case studies that looked at closing the loops, so getting stuff back, remanufacturing, refurbishing. Um, the, 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 the narrative that I see developing now around circular economy is very much about open concepts. And um, I'm going to talk about two German companies, uh, Slockit and Share and Charge. And what they both try to do is to increase the utilization rate of our products. And these are very new startups and they are sort of like, you know, the hottest thing in Germany. And um, because they are blockchain enabled. And don't ask me questions about blockchain because I, I, I honestly don't understand it. So if there's anybody here who can help me. But uh, I sort of sort of get the idea. Um, so block slock it first. Uh, they argue that anywhere where there are underused assets, such as uh, you know, office space, cars, machinery, apartments, um, there is an untapped opportunity to make a profit. It's a very interesting statement. And they are now developing this technology to make, as they say, apartments, like Airbnb apartments, to make them smart and to make, uh, to make office space smarter using blockchain and what this means is basically that they make doorknobs that look like these and um, and that allow the person who owns the apartment or who owns the office space or who owns the car to access uh, this um, uh, to, to control access to their depart to their apartment or to their car or to their office space and to actually to make this control of access completely automated uh, through the blockchain technology. Um, I, I'm going to believe them uh, on their word. I just find this fascinating to see how they have managed to co-opt the whole idea of circular economy into their business models. Same here with share and charge. Um, they have developed a business model where people owning an uh, electric vehicle can basically share or yeah, share their charging station and um, with others so that it enables other people uh, to charge uh, electric vehicles anywhere they go so they have developed uh, well this is uh, I just copied this from their website so you register your charging station and I'm guessing that in Germany people own their own charging stations because in Holland it's different infrastructure um, you can set a tariff for your charging station and you can uh, diversify like friends and family can can go cheaper but people you don't know they need to pay more so that's all possible and uh, you let somebody charge you allow them access to your charging station and then your earnings they will go into a special account and you can use this um, to charge at other people's charging stations forever for instance and the whole idea is that this will make the network of charging opportunities much more dense and it will actually stimulate electric vehicles and, uh, and, and, and the uptake of e-vehicles. So it's, it's in a way, it's a great idea. So future, the future might be uh, in technology-enabled sharing platforms like the two startups I've just described. Um, and interestingly, what you see happening here is that, that us, 
you know, you and I, as consumers, are becoming prosumers in a way. So, so um, it would enable us, if we owned something, a car, uh, an apartment, um, to start sharing it or to start giving other people access to it and making money out of it, so making profits out of the stuff that you own. And, um, and interestingly, this leads to, to, to sort of ethical questions almost like, um, what does it mean to own? And um, if you are allowed to give people access, who do you give access to and who not? And are you allowed also to exclude people? Um, so to be very specific on who you want to give access and who not, and is there, are we going to have this, uh, this, this future of people who own and people who don't own? And there's also an interesting tension because in, in, the, in the business models that we just described, like with Bugaboo and, um, and with Neopost, it's all about leasing and actually not owning stuff. So is the future going back to owning again? I don't have answers to these questions, but, uh, but I do think they're fascinating and, and, <coughs> and this may be a really disruptive thing that that's in a way can enable or disrupt or disable maybe the circular economy. So again, something we may explore in the discussion. Um, one example of where uh, it has become really disruptive actually is, is China. And you may have seen this picture, it was from The Guardian. Um, it says the problem in China where cities are flooded with bikes that are part of the bicycle sharing systems and they, have, they, they are fiercely competitive and they all want uh, uh, bike sharing schemes to work. So what happened as a result is that the cities in China, some cities, Shanghai I believe, has been flooded really with bikes and they had to sort of carry them off and, 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 and yeah, dump them. So this has made for some very beautiful pictures. But it's also one of those examples of where a startup like Share and Charge or Slockit may look very clean and nice, uh, but um, such initiatives, when they become successful, they can quickly go out of hand and, and there can be all kinds of unwanted side effects. Another thing uh, to be aware of. So, um, I've come to the end of my lecture and I'm going to give you three takeaways from things that I've learned over the years and, uh, and I hope um, you have picked up from the examples I've given. First one is the, the difficulty of capturing value from going circular and how often this is totally underestimated. And I think the bugaboo example is one uh, that showed this. Um, companies are so used to their, the, their current way of doing business, they are locked into it, uh, that making this change um, is, is just extremely complicated and the difficulties are underestimated and we should spend time and attention on that, otherwise we, it may fail. Secondly, the product design can play a pivotal role, but it needs to be considered in conjunction with circular business model development. Um, the Neopost example was a great example of where product design really added value, but it helped, it could do so because there was this clear idea of life cycle of product. Um, and the Herman Miller example actually showed that uh, the focus on product design was really good, but they didn't follow through because they didn't have this idea of how to recover the, the products at the end of their life. So it, the, the two need to go together, hand in hand. And finally, circular economy is about products, making products last. It's about intensifying their use, so the inner circles, but it's also about closing loops. And, um, and these things are not or, or, but they should be and, and, I think. It sometimes it's forgotten the way uh, these, these, these future ideas of, I just showed, the sharing economy models, the way they sort of co-opt the whole idea of circular economy. Um, uh, claim it's part of the narrative where it's all very nice but uh, if you start you know developing sharing platforms for uh, charging your vehicle what will happen at the end of life of these charging stations that's not taken into account so again uh, for me <coughs> circular economy should have the whole picture and it should be taken into account so thank you very much I hope you enjoyed it
Firstly, thank, thanks very much for, for that. That's very interesting. I think there's some cautionary tales there, I guess. So it's good actually to uh, to hear some, um, you know, sort of moderating sort of views on on how easy, easy these things are. I think uh, for a lot of businesses, obviously, um, risk and and some of these issues that you've raised are, are at the forefront of the, the minds when they're thinking about these things. But also some very positive thoughts about how you can overcome some of the, the problems as well. Um, one thing I was interested in um, was something that you kind of raised in regard to Bugaboo. Um, I wonder to an extent whether some of these models uh, are kind of uh, for niche uh, markets, if you like. You know, we've, we've heard a lot about mud jeans. Uh, they're quite an expensive way of buying jeans, frankly. Uh, we've heard about these bundles in the Netherlands, which does Miele washing machine lease, um, again, quite an expensive arrangement. Um, I guess people are willing to pay a little bit more for convenience and the regularity of knowing, you know, they're only going to pay so many uh, euros a month or pounds per month or whatever. But I, I wonder whether you have any thoughts on how some of these kind of niche uh, businesses can be made mainstream, if you like. What's it going to take? Does it require much greater policy uh, intervention, or is it something that uh, you know businesses can do from from within, if you like? Yeah. Um, wow. Great question. Um, part of the answer is scaling. Um, I spoke to a guy from Bosch not too long ago, and he said that in Belgium uh, they were now doing a big pilot with, if I recall correctly, a two two thousand people that are living in poverty um, and they were actually doing the same thing as bundles so they were they are actually rolling out a paper wash uh, service so they put washing machines in these people's homes and uh, they charge it a paper wash um, a very small uh, a very uh, a reasonable amount of money and, um, and I asked him, you know, how on earth are you actually going to make a profit from this? He said, well, we made careful calculations and it should work based on the quality of our washing machines, the fact that they don't need servicing, they will not need repair, and, um, and we, we think we can do this. So th they're going to pilot it. So, but it does require scale in order to work. And, um, and I know that I spoke with a guy from Bundles as well, and he said the same thing. He said, you know, yes, it's all very nice, and it's all for the, you know, we started with the people who could afford all this, but we now want to scale into the, the, the social sector, as, as we call it in Holland, so the people with lesser income, and, um, because that's where the market is, really. Uh, so maybe that's, that's an answer to your question. A part of an answer, at least. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should, we should throw it open to the, uh, to the floor. So has anybody got any questions uh, they'd like to ask Connie or David? Hi Connie, thanks so much. That was a really fantastic um, case study overview. I just wondered what you thought about particularly things like washing machines, about co-design. Co-design whether it's business to business or business to consumer. So for example with washing machines, uh, the research tells us that we don't really actually know what people do with their washing machines. So we don't know how robust they are or how we can make them more circular. So do you see, from an industrial design perspective, the opportunity for co-design yeah. in um, B2B or B2C? A scary question almost, because this project that we're going to start with Gorenje, uh, our role will be to co-design or co-develop uh, the whole interface with consumers so that we because it, it will be a different washing machine you get in your house when it becomes a paper wash washing machine. So you need feedback and uh, you need to understand what your, how your actions uh, actually, um, uh, what it basically how much it costs when you choose a specific program if you want 90 degrees or 60 degrees or 30 degrees wash. It will probably differentiate in price so we can actually even maybe stimulate people to wash at lower temperatures. So we can try to start injecting, um, or if, if we're clever and if we can do it in co-design with the consumers, to injecting all kinds of ways to start people, to make people aware of their washing behavior and to maybe even change it towards less impactful washing behavior. So I'm very hopeful there, but we still need to get started with it. 
I'm, I'm having slight difficulty framing the question, so I apologize for that. But I guess there's an easy model for, uh, if you look at second-hand cars, that uh, most of the major car manufacturers will have a, a manufacturer's warranty program that says we take a second-hand car, we, we, uh, BMW has a 12-year, sorry, 12-month warranty on a, a used car. Um, that car from, from that BMW approved dealer costs more than if you go to the second-hand car market. And so there's a price that's ascribed to the, the added value of the manufacturer approved compared to the new car, compared with the, the dealer around the corner who only offers you a two-week guarantee or so on. So my, my question really is, how do you actually ascribe the value in saying, well, it, it's, it's a scalable product, that. What happens if the scale comes down because you don't have so many of those types of cars coming through or components or machines or whatever it is? And how do you, how, uh, is there a, calcul a, a standard calculation method which says, if I have this product which I think is worth nothing, very little, it's clearly worth something to somebody else, but it needs fixing. Now, how much do you have to add in terms of needing fixing before it's then worth enough that he says, yeah, it's worth it because I can now sell it for more. So it, when I look at the butterfly diagram, I have great difficulty in seeing, so how do I calculate the added effort, which is cost, compared to the added value when I move up the hierarchy from recycle to um, through remanufacture, refurbish and reuse, et cetera? Just gracious. <laughs> I, I know, it's, I have difficulty framing the question, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> it's a great question, really. And, and it's, it's need maybe the holy grail of, of if, we can, <laughs> if, we, if we can put values. It will depend, of course, on the product category. You mentioned cars specifically, uh, which is an area that I, I'm not too aware of. So that's, so I, I, I'm, I, I don't know the market too well of cars. No, no but it's the same model if you say, well, a BMW, BMW can do it. So if they can do it, why can't Apple do it? It's a high-value product. It has a different. It has exactly the same kind of potential lifespan. Yeah, yeah. But do you know why Apple doesn't do it then? No, I don't. Oh, I don't. That's what was my question. If they said, why did we learn from BMW? If we could yeah. see how they add cost in, in refurbishing it and rewarranting it, then maybe it's worth it. I agree. I, I, it, yeah, I, I don't have an answer. I'm so sorry, but you have a very good remark. And, and if anybody has any idea why Apple isn't doing it. Uh, Yes, yes, please. Um, I, I suspect that Apple don't do that because they feel it will undermine new sales. And, you, you, you know, they're changing the technology and the model so rapidly that they're constantly trying to get people to move on to that, onto that next model by focusing on refurbished models. Potentially, they're focusing back a generation or two, which is the last thing they want to do. Their marketing is all about the next generation of, of iPhone and so on. So I, I suspect that's where they're business model is coming from but there are there are a whole variety of different approaches to making money aren't there and uh, I mean a lot of the, 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 the money that's made in the car sector nowadays is actually through PCP finance deals not through uh, the actual hardware so to speak um, I, I think as well just to to mention um, I'll respond to some of the comments earlier I think some of the models that you've talked about and the examples you've talked about are uh, companies trying to do things around um, you know, lease and repair and remanufacture and so on in, in relatively low value areas like the, um, the buggy uh, stroller example. Um, quite you, you buy one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, yeah, they're not cheap, I know. But, um, but I think often um, where remanufacturing is particularly valuable is where you've got a highly engineered, very expensive product. Uh, you know, a Rolls-Royce engine for an aerospace engine is an obvious example. You know, a Caterpillar uh, or, a, you know, an earth mover type expensive pieces of equipment which are very highly engineered. Um, Scotland has quite a few companies that are producing highly engineered products and already do remanufacturing very profitably. You know, so it's, uh, it's certainly done quite widely. Remanufacturing isn't a new thing. It's, it's kind of making that happen in areas where it doesn't already happen. And, um, you know, an example of that is uh, Stana Stairlifts, for example, where they've got a highly engineered product that's designed to last a very long time. They put that into the market and, until quite recently, waved goodbye to that highly engineered product. And as, as you were saying, somebody else then benefits from the great piece of design and engineering 
um, that's gone into that product. And so somebody else capitalizes on, yeah. on that. So it's about, can you as an OEM um, or another player in, in the market capitalize on something where that value is currently being lost? And uh, it seems it's, you know, it's that kind of Venn diagram, isn't it, where you're trying to grow that overlapping bit in the middle where everything kind of makes sense commercially. And it's partly about awareness, partly about business models, understanding what that gentleman said, the trade-off between the investment required and the, and the, the, um, the payback. You got any thoughts on that, David? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the industrial one's very interesting because one of the areas about it is obviously in certification. You know, the aspect is, as Mark said, you know, an aero engine or whatever it is, goes back to Rolls-Royce or whatever it is for refurbishment. Um, but also in other areas as well, for example, in automotive, or you get a reconditioned engine. Uh, and there's quite a, there's some activity in Scotland that goes on round about that. Um, then obviously what comes with it is the fact is that it's made as new. And it's made by the people who produce the original engines as well. So the whole aspect about it is that in certain areas where, and Connie mentioned about strollers and certification, when you go back to the OEM, um, there shouldn't be, he said, fingers crossed, certification issues because you're going back to the people who designed and built the original one. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to make um, that machine last longer and make go into not, not the case of an aero engine, uh, but some others as well, the non-critical uh, application. But interesting you're saying about, you know, the perception sometimes is that um, in, the, in the aerospace sector, um, engines come back for refurbishment. They've been doing it since the 50s, but they don't really promote the fact to customers that you're flying in an airplane with a reconditioned engine. They keep that very quiet. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and you've all flown in ones with reconditioned engines, I guarantee it. But with the same token, it's that sometimes perception that people may say it's of lesser reliability, quality, etc. And the OEM would absolutely categorically refute that. So. And, and justly so, because uh, actually I think a refurbished, reconditioned, remanufactured uh, products could actually be better than original. Yeah, because if you've, you've got the learning from the use of the product. So it's, it's, a, it's a myth, really, that it would be less. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hi Connie, thanks hey. very much. Um, so my question is around, I guess, one of the challenges of the circular economy, if it takes off and scales, is that um, if you're doing it right, then you'll be accumulating resources um, to exploit your profit. And that accumulation of resources leads to accumulated wealth. Uh, and in a world with growing wealth inequality, um, is there a role for designers to maybe challenge and, and look for ways to spread the wealth gained from the circular economy? Gosh. <laughs> Get some tricky questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um. You need to be more specific in your question. I mean, it's, it's such a generic question. It's so difficult to answer such a question. Is there a role? Yes, there will probably be a role for design because um, because such such very deep questions require design thinking, right, to be able to solve them. Uh, but I can't give you a cut and clear answer um, on how to how to do this really. Can I yeah, please. It's a really really interesting question, actually. But if you think about previous generations, you're far too young to remember perhaps what happened when I was a kid. Uh, well, you definitely didn't remember that, um, I can assure you. But um, in, in the olden days, you know, uh, people used to, to rent uh, and lease nearly everything. You know, my parents rented their TV from radio rentals or, or whatever it was, because the capital cost of, of buying the new thing at the time was, was prohibitive, you know. And, and I think one of the great challenges we've got in this day and age is that people have perhaps too much disposable income, you know, and ownership is, is too easy in a way, you know, and so we will buy an electric drill even though we only use it for one hour a year on average, you know, which is crazy that we do that. And similarly, you know, so many of our things have such low intensity of use and cars, cars being one example. But I think, I think perhaps there is a realization that um, for a lot of people who are disadvantaged, you know, the, the circular economy models can be of benefit to them because going back to a scenario where rather than being ripped off by uh, higher purchase agreements where they, they pay many times the value of the, of the product, 
um, to, to own it, uh, ultimately, uh, a cheap sofa or whatever it might be, a washing machine, that these lease models actually them give, give people a much better deal in that they can own a better product which is more reliable without any of the inconvenience that they might otherwise face from buying a cheap product. Um, you know, you think about a, a single mum having to struggle on, on a low income, for example. You know, some of these models can actually benefit those people in society uh, to, to a large extent. I don't know if that yeah. kind of helps. <laughs> More questions? Sorry. Just a thought. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as we heard last week, um, we were told that you either join the circular economy or you die. And have you, having heard what you said today, even regarding the the buggy, buggy uh, case study, where people returned the item older than expected. And it was meant to be a pilot study, right? So if a company decides to do a pilot study and they, it was just frustrating for them, uh, they couldn't go ahead with it. They feel, oh, this is not working for me. I just have to get out of business. Is there any help for such a company, or you just allow, the, or you allow them to fizzle out of business? That's the question. Well, zero waste Scotland, maybe. <laughs> so, my answer, yeah. I, um, yeah, I wanted to raise this earlier, actually. So, thank you for the question because it gives us the opportunity to mention the Circular Economy Investment Fund, which uh, Zero Waste Scotland runs. And I think for a lot of businesses, they do need that transitional funding to help them explore things, as you said, through a pilot, in that case, Horizon 2020, which is a European program, but Scotland has its own Circular Economy Investment Fund. Zero West Scotland also, through the Circular Economy program, is providing a significant number of days of, of consultancy support to businesses to help them get through, you know, some of these uh, difficult uh, sort of questions and help them to develop the business case um, and so on. So, you know, that we're fortunate in Scotland, I think, to have to have that to help that transitional period. Does that does that help answer your question? Yeah, as, uh, as Mark has said, the, the one thing which I, I was impressed with was the the approach from Zero Waste Scotland wasn't just to provide you know um, circular economy investment fund, because one of the things about that is that it's great having money there, but especially if you're an SME and you don't have the time or the, the knowledge and experience to access that. So as Mark said, the, the, the circular economy business support service is there exactly to do that. You know, there's money there, but how do you unlock it? So I think through uh, Zero Waste Scotland, there are also other products. I'm not here to make a pitch for Scottish Enterprise, but there's other products as well, as well in terms of from Business Gateway and from Scottish Enterprise that helps companies look at what the threats are to their business. So there's quite a bit in, in the landscape in Scotland to help support companies. Yeah, that's really great to hear. And I, I was just wondering, because um, I've been very open about this case study with Bugaboo, and it, it, even though it may not have been a wonderful success, um, uh, from an academic perspective, uh, having negative results is also very valuable sometimes, and not, not the story people want to hear most of the time. But is there also a possibility that through the experiences you get through this fund that you can share you know these real world stories because um, very often case studies that you find on the internet are all about oh it's wonderful and this is good and it doesn't really teach you anything does it because you know that um, that things can't have been that wonderful and good in real life um, so so i think that, that kind of experience uh, so the, the way companies, you know, make mistakes and how they learn from that—that that could be so helpful if that could somehow be part of the narrative uh, to help th things move forward. And, and that's why yeah. Horizon 2020 and Innovate UK and these other programs exist. You know, they're, they're there to to la allow a safe space for people to try things out and for others to learn from the mistakes that that they make, so that they don't make the same mistakes. I think what's important, as you say, is you know we never learn as much from success as we do from failure, you know. And so uh, hopefully all this sort of information is made public and people say, okay, yeah, not only they failed, but why they failed and how that can be avoided uh, next time around. 
Any more um, questions? Elsa? Right. So um, I teach a circular economy class here at Strathclyde, and some of my students are here in the room. And I gave them a challenge for the class, which is they had to do they have to do a self transformation project uh, related to the circular economy, and they have to capture their in a way their behaviour. They can focus on a particular aspect, but they have to capture it before and after. So it's about measuring change and what. How can, how can we measure change to do with the circular economy? So I was just wondering if uh, the three of you have any advice to the students because they're here in the room. Yeah. Oh, wow. So what do you mean by self-conservation? In terms of, for example, if you're changing in terms of the, the, your behavior to, do, to minimize waste or to, to become more circular, how do you capture, so you try to find out how, what you're doing first. We talked before about like the behavior in terms of washing behavior. So, for example, temperature you use or whatever, and then do a change and then see what, what you've gained in terms of circularity, is how you measure circularity. Cool. Yeah, we call this body storming in our faculty. So I sometimes get our students also to do these things like go for weeks without using a refrigerator or, uh, or imagine that they are holed up in their homes uh, and that there is a flood and that... <laughs> that they have to live for 72 hours uh, on just whatever is in the apartment, so they end up cooking spaghetti in beer. Because <laughs> they always have beer. And, uh, uh, so yeah, this is, a great, this is a great learning tool, because um, uh, it, 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 it does help you bring home the idea very clearly, uh, if you have to do it yourself. And I also try to be part of those experiments and live without a fridge, and it's just, I couldn't do it. So it was just, it was very interesting to learn. So it, Yes, compliments for that. Great idea to get started. Yeah, cool. I'd like to hear the results. I, th I think there's a more general problem um, in measuring how circular an economy is, you know, if you look at the, the macro scale, because all we're used to measuring, and we don't do this very well either, is measuring waste. You know, and what happens to the waste? Well, the whole idea with circularity is that it doesn't become waste, and we don't measure it. So, how do you measure what's going on on eBay or FreeCycle or any of those platforms that, you know, are actually this sort of grey market that really is, you know, part of the, of, of the circular economy? And, and people are struggling, are struggling with that. You know, do, do we just purely measure resource consumption um, or is it more than, more than that? Any more? Questions? Um, yeah, my question is a little bit in the same direction as about where you see the shifting of input and output in the circular economy um, with regards, for example, for energy. It's really, really important that emissions are measured and certain um, industries, especially the manufacturing industry, is using a lot of energy and is always claiming emissions are causing problems and reducing emissions is important. but Remanufacturing doesn't necessarily aim at that. How do you, how do you communicate that to businesses who want to include that model? Can you answer that? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, th I think inherently, uh, remanufacturing does reduce, um, you know, uh, uh, emissions of all of all of all kinds. Really, you know, if you're taking back components, subassemblies, materials, and then you know, putting those into new products, okay, there's, there's uh, obviously still an impact associated with that, but it's nowhere near the same impact as going from raw materials through to a new product. You know, if we, I think in society as, as a whole, it used to be the case anyway a few years ago that for every ton of product, we actually use 10 tons of resources, you know, because of all the waste on the way through to, to the product stage. Um, so inherently by taking the thing back in a closed loop, you, you're reducing that dramatically. Is that what you meant? Or, uh... Yeah, but I feel like the infrastructure isn't really there yet to mm, yeah. efficiently yeah. reduce, let's say, for example, transportation, logistics, are taking up a lot of that. And where you have relatively small-scale businesses who are in, involved in this process, you have a really small infrastructure. So in order to really make that efficiently work, I feel it has to be scaled quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I wonder, are we there yet? No, no, good point. Um, 
there are studies that, that measure material intensity of societies. That's material flow analysis kind of studies. And they are not, uh, I mean, the latest studies I've read were not too optimistic in that respect. So we are still a long way uh, away from actually achieving uh, a society that, 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 that is circular in that respect. So that, that reduces its material intensity uh, and, the f and the flow of materials through society. And that, that on the remanufacturing and the measurement, by the way, there is a, a United Nations report, either just published or coming out soon, that tries to measure the sustainability impact of reman. And I, I've, I had the pleasure to review it uh, uh, last year, at the end of last year. And it's filled with uh, <laughs> calculations, diagrams. So, um, so if, try to find it. I hope it's online by now, or it will be soon. It's uh, United Nations, and it's something with remanufacturing in the title. It's just come out. Yeah. It's come out. Cool. Yeah, and um, so you you can then really get some data, which is obviously what you're also looking for. Yeah. I'll make yeah. Another point. Um, just just a couple of points around that, though. I think firstly, uh, transport impacts tend to be overstated. That's the first thing. Um, RAP um, in you know UK. Um, did some studies looking at the impacts of transport of plastic waste to, uh, and paper waste actually to uh, China, um, and actually transporting, even if you were to uh, lease a container ship and take plastic waste to Shanghai, you only diminish the benefit of recycling by about 10%. You know, and so shipping by sea, for example, is very, very low impact. So I think sometimes the transport impacts are overstated. The, the whole idea um, in terms of remanufacturing and, and circular economy in regard to UK manufacturing is about keeping the stuff close to where you know it's disposed of or, or, or discarded if you like or whatever uh, consequently you know we want to see highly engineered products that are in the UK market staying uh, in the UK market and being remanufactured in the UK which again reduces the overall impact um, what was the other thing I was going to say or something else, but it's escaped me. Yeah, one of the things I was going to pick up on was not so much with the transport, but in terms of the energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency for manufacturing, as you say, there are manufacturing sectors who are large consumers. You know, you know as I say, cement, for example, cement manufacturing is very energy intensive. Um, however, like anything else in business orientated, they're very well aware of that. And the whole move towards energy efficiency and the decarbonisation of in, of industry is very topical just now, and it's very much in focus. So, um, I view it as almost a secondary one. Where if I was a manufacturer and I'm putting in energy efficiency measures to um, affect my initial or my primary production, I'm going to look at implementing the same in my terms of my refurbishment programme. So there is certainly a focus in terms of the energy consumption from that point of view. Again, the, the transport one is a, is a, a very challenging one because the fact is that how, how local does it have to be to get that economy of scale? Yeah, I remembered the things I was going to say. Um, reverse logistics is a, is a, big, a big issue for all of this. As, as Connie said, um, the next lecture actually, come to the next lecture because we've got somebody from DHL. Um, some of the big logistics companies are, are getting very switched on to all of this and, and the opportunities around take back. Um, and so uh, the next lecture will be partly about, about that and how uh, some of these big logistics companies are starting to enable um, take back um, in, a, in an efficient way. Um, the, the other point, as, as David was saying, you know, you don't want a washing machine to last 30 years because the standards will have changed and the energy efficiency side will have uh, you know, things will have moved on in terms of the technology and the efficiency of the motors and all the rest of it. Um, that's a bit of a tricky one. You know, we need to incentivise um, the uh, the OEMs and the uh, the other people in the supply chain to keep the product in use for the optimum length of time. You know, and so uh, standards are changing all the time. Where you've got the energy efficiency ratings on on products and cars and so on, clearly they are getting tightened all the time and that will help to drive the market and um, if you came last week we had um, the chap from River Simple Cars talking about upgradability you know and that is such a, a crucial aspect of, of design for circular economy you know upgradability in terms of the efficiency of some of the key components whether it be the motherboard um, in the 
um, franking machine or it, or it be you know, the motors in, a, in an electric vehicle. Um, we've got to obviously uh, allow for that um, to, to keep the efficiency gains uh, in the economy. how design is actually changing to uh, to having to incorporate this, this time element. It's one of the, the things I find so fascinating about my research area is that, that we, we have to, as designers, we're so used to creating these beautiful products and then we deliver it uh, so that you can buy it and then our job is done. But this whole circular economy changes the whole way we have to think about design and we really need to start taking into account this whole life cycle and, and the different use cycles within uh, and to design for that. Because yes, you can say we don't want a washing machine to last 30 years, but why not? <laughs> we can design for that to make it upgradable and to incorporate potential e energy efficiency. Uh, but we just need to start thinking that way, which we aren't doing. So um, thanks for that. Yep. Good. And I think the lease, you know, the lease model, if you actually own it, if you own the product as the, as the supplier, you're not letting go of the product, you own it and you've got to kind of get as much value from that product as possible, then you are incentivized to make sure that it's got future, you know, it's future proof, that it's, it can be upgraded and so on, because it's in your interest uh, to do so, you know. Um, I'm not sure what time it is because I've, I've handed over my watch, so we're well over time actually, so um, we should draw a line and there's, there's some drinks outside. Um, I believe we get booted out of the building about 8 o'clock, so you're going to have to drink quickly. Um, but there's some alcohol, uh, I believe, and nibbles out where the coffee was earlier, and some non-alcoholic refreshment for those of you who are driving. So uh, thanks all for coming. And before we leave, can we just thank the, the speakers in the normal way? Um,